Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alison Furr, the uh, chairman of Blacker, and it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to our latest online seminar, joint with IPCAT. Um, we had a, a session last summer on the Advocate General's opinion in the YouTube and uh, CNDO ruling, and now hot off the press, we've got um, not only the opinion, but the ruling of the Court of Justice. Um, so it's um, a particular pleasure to um, have the seminar joint with IPCAT as before. And before we uh, pass over to the panelists, I'll just mention a few housekeeping points. And um, the first is that, as you know, your audio will be um, muted for the whole seminar to prevent feedback and ex extraordinary noises. Um, if your connection fails, just uh, re-click on the individual link that you've been sent. It, it can be reused. Um, the panellists will be happy to receive questions. You should find um, a, a question um, function in your right-hand panel, I guess it's that side, there's a little square with an arrow. And if you click on that, um, you can then um, send the questions, um, which will be seen by the panel only. Um, and please identify yourself um, when you're asking a question, if it's not obvious from your, your title on the screen. Um, we'll try and do as many questions as possible, um, but there is a facility for speakers to um, to answer questions if, if they have time um, in the question channel. Now, we are going to try to record the session and we hope very much that we will be able to make available a recording later on. Um, and if that's the case, if it's a success, we will let everyone know who is registered. So, warm thanks in advance to all our panel um, and to Eleonora Rosati, um, Professor Dr. Eleonora of IPCAT and Lund University, um, and also to, to Jeremy Bloom, who is um, going to be firing many of the um, questions to panelists, um, and he's a partner at Bristow's. Um, we thank, as always, Bristow's webinar team. So I think everyone's in now. Uh, well, a few people coming, but we'll we'll get cracking. I'll pass you over to Eleonora. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, uh, Alison, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like uh, to just extend uh, my thanks uh, on behalf uh, of the IPCAT blog and uh, uh, the Intellectual Property Center IFIM at Stockholm University uh, for uh, joining uh, today's event. And of course, uh, my gratitude goes uh, to the speakers uh, who are uh, so generously uh, devoting their time uh, to analyze uh, the content and implications uh, of a ruling uh, that uh, was uh, really awaited for a long time. It's been uh, nearly a year since the advocate's general opinion. A lot has happened in the meantime. So uh, I personally very much look forward to the discussion that we're going to have uh, over the next uh, couple of hours or so. We are also very happy to have uh, last year's speakers, uh, Julia Reda and Lauri Reckart, uh, as well as uh, uh, two new speakers, uh, Ursula Fender-Schmidt and uh, Georg Nolte, uh, who have a direct knowledge of the uh, background national proceedings as well as the, the CJU uh, proceedings. So thanks so much for enriching uh, the expertise of today's panel. And of course, uh, my gratitude to Jeremy Bloom from Bristos for accepting uh, once again to chair today's panel. And with that, uh, I hand it over uh, to Jeremy and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eleonora. Um, and thank you all the panelists and thank you for everyone for joining today. Um, before we ask the panelists for their views about this, this decision, I think I'll just set the scene. And I don't think I put it too highly by saying that this decision defines the complex relationship under the nearly out of date current regime between rights holders internet platforms and their users. 
Today, we are likely to hear views across the philosophical divide about how this area should be governed. The judgment affects how internet can be, can be used by users and also used by commercial operators, be they rights holders or service providers or end users. Obviously, you all attended our rapid response webinar last year that Eleonora had just mentioned, but it's probably worth reminding you about the issues in this case and the questions referred. The judgment is in the context of proceedings before the Court of Justice and there's requests for preliminary rulings from the Bundesgerichtshof in Germany in relation to two actions. The first relates to an action against YouTube for the uploading of certain Sarah Brightman recordings into videos or stills by users of the YouTube platform. The claimant in that case was Mr. Peterson and he claimed copyright in the music tracks um, and sought YouTube to disable those videos, which YouTube did, but the music reappeared later in other videos. The second action was about a cyber locker called Uploaded, which allows file hosting and sharing storage space. In, in, in Uploaded, a user can share links to the content stored on that platform. That complaint was about the uploading of certain medical books, books on the platform um, without authorization, and links were then made available by those users to access the works. So the reference to the Court of Justice relates to a couple of questions. The first is about the scope of Article 3 of the InfoSoc Directive and the right to communicate works to the public. The, the other main legal point is about the applicability of Article 14 of the e-commerce directive and where an intermediary service provider stores content at the request of its users in circumstances where it has no knowledge of the illegal activity or acts and, ex, and acts expeditiously to remove that content when it receives knowledge. So this is called the hosting defense. So I'm just gonna quickly recite the questions asked and I'm gonna paraphrase them, not, not to take up too much time, but the first was, does a platform on which videos containing content protected by copyright um, made publicly accessible by users without the consent of the rights holders, does it carry out an act of communication within the meaning of Article 3? If that platform makes profits, the upload process takes place automatically and without control. There are terms and conditions about copyright. The operator provides tools, so right holders can take steps to block infringing videos. The operator organizes and indexes the content. And the operator is not specifically aware of the availability of copyright infringing content, or after having become aware, expeditiously deletes that content or expeditiously disables access. The second question, um, again paraphrased, does an internet video platform under the conditions described above in question one come within the scope of the hosting defense? And then the third question is, must the actual knowledge of the Ill illegal activity in order to lose the hosting defense relate to specific illegal activities? So there are the questions. So that sets the scene. And now let's, let's see what the panelists have to say about this, this um, very important decision. So, um, Eleonora, um, what do you make of the Court of Justice's approach um, to assessing whether YouTube or Uploaded were themselves making a communication to the public? And I think when I was reading the decision, I was particularly interested about the, con the, co the comments from the court, how it talks about an indispensable role in relation to the Act, but then saying one might not be liable if that role was not deliberate. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I would like to answer your question uh, by uh, briefly noting that in his uh, articulate uh, and complex opinion, the Advocate General uh, had indicated a number of choices and had ranked them. And uh, his preferred view was uh, for the Court of Justice uh, to take a different course uh, in its construction of the right of communication to the public, uh, notably by rejecting uh, the accessibility approach, uh, which has come to be established over time, and embrace instead a transmission approach. You need to actually transmit something to have an act of communication. And uh, uh, this is uh, the view that he thought would be preferable. 
if the Court of Justice had not accepted uh, to proceed along these lines, uh, then he presented alternative views. He also uh, formulated a uh, um, fairly articulated uh, criticism of uh, uh, three decisions in particular. They are the rulings in uh, Finspeller, uh, GS Media, and Ziggo, and uh, uh, was highly critical of whether the Court of Justice had actually got those cases right, and uh, uh, suggested that the Court should not follow the reasoning in those cases. Uh, they would not be relevant in a situation like uh, the one attend in these uh, joint cases. But uh, nonetheless, uh, he said that uh, should the Court of Justice decide uh, to apply its earlier uh, teachings in uh, GS Media, Finspeller and uh, Pirate Bay, then he said uh, you need to assess whether there is indeed an essential or indispensable role, which is also deliberate. So, when it comes to the actual judgment of the Court of Justice, there is a relation between what the Advocate General had suggested and, and how the Court reasons, because indeed the Court says, okay, of these options, I choose, the, I choose this one, which requires consideration of whether there is a role that is both essential and deliberate. So, in part, the ambiguity of the language used by the Court of Justice owes to the language used by the Advocate General in the first place, but I would say that uh, if one reads the judgment, the Court of Justice does not really articulate a new test. It uh, uh, sits uh, well uh, together with its earlier cases uh, because it has been a, a long established line of rulings in which the Court of Justice has said that, that you need to consider in certain situations, uh, that is where there is just an accessibility and not also transmission of a work, whether there is an indispensable role played by the user of copyright works without which uh, the public will not access that content or will find it more difficult to access. In any case, what is required is also the uh, full knowledge of the consequences of this making available. So I feel that the Court of Justice simply reiterates this earlier uh, test that adopted in uh, these um, um, previous rulings. Insofar as uh, the uh, essentiality indispensability of uh, one's own intervention, uh, here the court uh, seemed to bring up something uh, that uh, has become increasingly relevant uh, in uh, more recent cases, and it is uh, recital 27 of the InfoSoc Directive, the fact uh, that the mere provision of facilities is not an act of communication, and this is something uh, that uh, we have seen in a number of cases, and also recently, for instance, in the STEAM and SAMI referral concerning uh, rental cars and communication to the public. So the Court of Justice said that if the role is simply, so to say, essential and not also deliberate, there is the risk of falling within the application of Recital 27. So this is a requirement, but it is not enough to have an act of communication. We also need to look at whether the intervention at issue qualifies as deliberate. And the Court of Justice in this respect painted a complex but not entirely new picture. It said that there is this deliberate role when one has actual knowledge of what is doing, that it is communicating copyright protected materials without a license from right holders and potentially in breach of copyright, or also when there is a constructive knowledge and the Court of Justice articulates a uh, multi-factor assessment, not a checklist, a number of uh, considerations to be taken into account to determine whether indeed there is uh, this constructive knowledge that might qualify for the application of Article 3. I hope that uh, with this uh, I have answered your question. Absolutely. I mean, one thing one thing I was interested in when, when you talked about the three sort of early decisions, um, including GS Media, I mean, I think lots of listeners probably were intrigued with the Advocate General's opinion when the, the Advocate General suggested that that it's time to depart from, from for example, GS Media. Um, but the Court of Justice, if I recall in this decision, didn't, 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 didn't go near that. Um, were you surprised? But I, I would say that uh, it didn't expressly do that because uh, no one likes uh, to contradict themselves uh, and the Court of Justice even less so, also considering uh, that here the judge rapporteur uh, is the same judge rapporteur as in these earlier cases. So uh, it will mean a bit going against uh, his uh, earlier uh, positions. 
However, uh, the Court of Justice, I think in this case, uh, scaled down uh, GS Media quite significantly uh, because uh, it, uh, it didn't say we got it wrong in GS Media. It actually uh, noted that, that this approach taken in GS Media was meant to reduce the risk of liability for uh, everyday internet users. So it was a patch put on the wound created by Svensson. So uh, the Court of Justice tried to justify the approach in that case. But what it did here in uh, the YouTube Siando ruling was uh, to limit the scope of application of GS media and in particular the presumption that the Court of Justice introduced for for-profit link providers. Uh, the Court of Justice said that this is a presumption that does not apply beyond the realm of linking, so in doing so, in doing so uh, substantially addressed a doubt that arose uh, after the Pirate Bay ruling. There the Court of Justice said something that might have been interpreted in the sense that the GS media presumption would also apply in the case of platforms. I personally read the GS media uh, ruling like that. Uh, now the Court of Justice is saying, no, that is not the case. That presumption remains limited to linking and that's it. In so doing, I'm not persuaded that the Court of Justice uh, uh, adopted, uh, you know, um, you know, um, criticism proof type of reasoning because it said that here the analogy cannot be made because in a linking cases you know what you are linking to but in the case of platforms the platforms do not know what people upload so it is not possible to reason along the same lines but Arguably, also in linking situations, it is not always said that one knows what is linking to because the content linked to may change over time. It's not that one has control over the third party website. So it might be the case that when you first provide the link, you have a certain content, but that content might be changed without you actually having any control over that. So I'm not sure that this reasoning holds true in each and every case, but this is what the Court of Justice did. Did. And I would like uh, to uh, conclude this uh, by saying uh, that this is by no means unprecedented. Uh, we have had uh, several instances in uh, copyright uh, and in particular in communication to the public situations in which the Court of Justice uh, has not uh, said deliberately um, that uh, it was doing something, but as a matter of fact, did. And in this respect, uh, I would like to draw uh, as an example uh, what happened a few months ago in March uh, with the ruling in uh, VG Bill Kunst concerning uh, contractual restrictions on linking. Um, in his opinion, uh, the Advocate General, uh, it was uh, Advocate General Spooner, said, uh, look, uh, this new public public criterion uh, does not make sense, we need to change approach. It is uh, ridiculous to say that uh, the, uh, the public that one has in mind when uh, authorizing uh, uh, publication on a freely accessible basis is everyone. The Court of Justice did not expressly say you are right, but as a matter of fact, reduced the uh, criterion of the new public. And I feel that in this situation, we are not seeing something completely dissimilar. So nothing new, it is a part of a CJU approach to communication to the public cases. Yeah, thank you, very interesting. Um, just, just before we move on into a, a slightly different topic, um, you mentioned it was a, a multifactorial assessment, you know, in the context of considering whether the intervention was deliberate. Um, could you just set out um, the, the factors the Court of Justice actually set out in its judgment, um, which need to be considered for that, for that assessment? Yes, I would say that uh, to simplify, the Court of Justice made uh, two major distinctions. The first one is a situation in which a platform has actual knowledge of the specific illegal content, for instance, because it has been notified, uh, and that is one instance. And then there are cases in which uh, knowledge can be construed so it is not presumed but it is constructive knowledge in light of uh, what is likely to become another mythological IP figure that is the diligent economic operator uh, that is you know the standard that the court of justice has adopted 
and uh, it, is, it is saying that uh, you need to see whether a diligent economic operator would adopt technological measures to credibly and effectively counter copyright infringements. And here it noted that what YouTube has done might be regarded as a, a credible and effective in contrasting copyright infringements. Uh, then uh, you need to consider whether the platform engages in content selection, whether uh, it has uh, tools uh, to allow people to infringe copyright or gives recommendations on how to infringe copyright. Uh, then it said uh, you need to look also at the profit making intention of the platform and also whether it's a financial model is for instance a piracy oriented and then it said that it is another important factor to look at the percentage of illegal content vis-a-vis -vis lawful content and here it made an important distinction between for instance what is the percentage of this content on youtube vis-a-vis -vis uploaded this Court of Justice said uh, is not something that has been resolved uh, yet uh, at the national court level, but when it is, uh, it is likely to have a significant weight. So all in all, not a checklist. It's not that you have to tick all the boxes. It seems to be a balanced exercise uh, that depends on the circumstances at issue. So, so if we can just pick that up a bit more, because I know that they're the sort of overarching factors the Court of Justice mentioned. But Georg, maybe in relation to YouTube specifically, um, I know the Court of Justice talks about clarification um, in relation to the facts. And I, and I think the Court of Justice, you know, it's not its job, but but here's here's some clarification for the referring court. Can you maybe give some some a bit more explanation about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, first I want to just to point out, I think it's really important to to see that the Court of Justice here on the communication to the public right follows its path to make the question of the communication to the public subject to a rather normative assessment in the individual case. And Eleonora pointed out that you know, it's about central role, but it's also about whether the intervention in the copyright infringement is deliberate and whether the, 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 the operator acted in full knowledge of your consequences. Most of that is not new. Uh, Eleonora also pointed out the new criteria in regard to reading, sharing, sharing services and share hosts. And I think for YouTube, the, the decisive part is that para 84 of the decision, whether, you know, a video sharing service contributes to infringements. And here's the main quote, and I quote it again. Uh, Eleonora already mentioned that sentence, but I think this is really the core of the decision. Uh, the core states that uh, um, it, you know you're not communicating to a public as a video sharing service if you refrain or if the operator refrains uh, from putting in place the appropriate or it, you are communicating if if you are refrain from putting in place the appropriate technological measures that can be expected from a reasonably diligent operator in its situation in order to counter credibly and effectively copyright infringements. I mean, we will, might talk about uh, the overlap with Article 70 later, but that sounds, that reminded me when I read this first and uh, a little bit reminded me that on the best efforts requirement under Article 70. And I think that's, you know, part of the idea of the court to establish some sort of coherence between the old liability regime, which will, you know, still remain valid in the future and Article 70. So as you point out, the court doesn't make a final decision that's up to the national court but in regard to youtube i think the court really you know didn't leave much choices uh, for the national court uh, the uh, ecj lists all the measures that youtube is undertaking in order to protect copyright infringements so there's no selection uh, uh, of content uploaded by the users um, then the court points out that youtube informs its users via you know terms of services and, and community guidelines that you know copyright infringements are not tolerated and prohibited and really urges users to respect copyright and also has a repeat infringer policy where you know accounts are terminated if you repeatedly infringe copyrights and then the court very shortly which you know it comes as a surprise uh, mentions uh, various uh, technological measures that YouTube is uh, undertaking, the notice of, uh, and takedown system, then con content verification program where you basically can send bulk notifications, and then content ID, uh, automated content recognition tool that YouTube has. 
and then and that's you know uh, central for YouTube it, it, the court comes to the conclusion that it's apparent that YouTube counters credibly and effectively uh, copyright infringement on its platform so I think it's very clear how the court needs to decide the, uh, the specific case and I mean on a personal level I mean after all the fights we had in Europe in the recent years uh, about YouTube and copyright I think to have that statement uh, uh, of the highest European court that you know what we do is uh, is uh, credibly and effectively uh, uh, to uh, in, uh, preventing copyright infringement. I, I was really happy if I if I read this, and I think that assessment is right. So I hope that answers uh, your question. No, thank you. So it's looking positive from from that perspective. What about uploaded? Um, what did, was there? Is it quite so positive in the Court of Justice's decision for uploaded? Um, Ursula, maybe you've got any thoughts on that? And maybe, Lowry, if you've got any, any comments in relation to Georg's um, 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 views, maybe, maybe Ursula, if you first deal with uploaded, please. Yeah, well, I, I think to get the whole scope of this decision and also its achievements, uh, we have to look back a little bit. In, in 2006, at the time when Spotify was only founded and phone streaming platforms were not really big yet, Sharing of copyrighted, uh, copyrighted content went from torrent systems like Napster and the Pirate Bay to big share hosting services like RapidShare and Mega Upload. Um, as anonymization um, on those share houses was much easier and therefore illegal sharing was much easier. So, uh, and there, then, back then, the general legal opinion was that the communication to the public has to be determined purely technical. So back then we had the approach, the Advocate General actually um, suggested to take again that the communication to the public um, is only something that would have to be determined um, by the technical, technically providing access um, to the public with regard to a certain work. Um, and only the one who was, from a technical perspective, providing access to the public regarding the certain work was actually communicating to the public. Internet platforms were merely seen then as infrastructure providers, which are not liable if they were complying with Article 14 e-commerce and were, take down, were taking um, content down they were given notice for. However, some internet services seem to make a rather good business out of hosting content that could be shared easily and anonymously. Such platforms complied with takedowns, yes, but this was not sustainable for right holders as searching for infringements is very expensive for right holders and hard to do from the outside and to do it forever. So this was not an option um, in this case. Um, and also, uh, there were rapid re-uploads um, after, uh, after the takedowns. So the, there were even automated tools back then for re-uploads, which might still exist. So in, in 2007, we started the first test case against the then biggest share host, the Rapid Share. You remember the world's largest, um, for the world's largest collecting society, Gamer and a group of other rights holders, um, which were massively infringed in their rights by those huge sharing machines. Um, this first step we took went right up to the uh, German Federal Court, and, uh, which decided for the first time that platforms like RapidShare had to do more than only take down a specific piece of content, but uh, would also have to prevent re-uploads, not only for the same file, but also for the same work. This was when the notice stay down principle had been born and a first indirect responsibility for share hosting platforms, the so-called Störerhaftung, which is referred to in this um, uh, new case now as well, um, which expresses a responsibility that results from a certain position that allows to take effective action against infringements. Now, being imposed um, with those new obligations, RabbitShare closed shortly after the decision in 2013 and was then fully dissolved in 2015. After RabbitShare's closing down, another shareholder soon got in the pole position of sharing illegal content, and this was then uploaded. 
Again, with a group of right holders, we took the next step to take action against this share holder, but this time not only to get injunctive relief, but also regarding damages. As we saw, the shareholder, uh, the shareholder taking the main responsibility in those massive infringements. Uploaded was actually setting up a system which allowed easy and anonymous uploads as well as tools that facilitated subsequent sharing of links generated and offered a payback model to its users by the number of downloads generated uh, by a certain piece of content. And although Uploaded argued that they were just a neutral storage system, the users did not actually pay for the storage, um, but the users paid for the download volumes. So the, the business model was related to very attractive and therefore most probably copyrighted content, which had to be paid for um, at another source. So our argument was from the beginning that a diligent person of business, which would actually offer a storage system, would take measures to prevent large scale infringements um, by, for example, limiting the number of downloads from a personal locker store. But upload it um, did actually the opposite. It supported large scale downloads of certain files by providing cash payments to the users who had uploaded such files. So it was clear that this service had set up a structure that must lead to millions of infringements because people were able to earn cash money out of this. And with this void structure in place, the measures officially taken, like, for example, responding to takedowns, must fail. The new test case then um, went up to the courts, uh, through the courts in Germany. And in parallel, as Eleonora pointed out, the CJEU cases on communication to the public evolved. We had the linking cases of Spence and Bestwater and GS Media, as well as the Pirate Bay and Film Sphere. When the federal court in Germany Germany referred the Alphabet case then to the European Court of Justice, the referral came which indicated that it would be uploaded for its operators and its operators um, in a central role um, without knowledge of a specific piece of content, but with general knowledge. of infringing actions at scale. The European Court of Justice is now even going one step further. It confirms the central role of a platform like this uh, works, uh, without such platform. Regarding the deliberate action of such platforms, the clarifications are very helpful. The clarifications in um, the clarifications in paragraph um, 84 um, of the facts that lead to a deliberate act specifically address the argument of a structural infringer by pointing to the provision of tools for infringement, the selection of infringing content, and the business model which promotes infringements. So it, it even goes one step further. Um, even if the operator has only general knowledge and does not act um, with regard to uh, the illegal infringements, let's say, um, if they have general knowledge by receiving regular takedown notices, it must do what a reasonable diligent operator in this situation would do to, to counter uh, such infringements effectively. And so therefore the operator is no longer allowed to put uh, the, hand in, uh, the head in the sand uh, but they must take responsibility and put effective measures in place to prevent harm from third parties. Um, I think it is also very helpful that the European Court of Justice stated that a, a specific portion of illegal content, as, as you also said, Eleonora, um, on the platform does not is not necessary um, to be proven, as this is, of course, always hard uh, from the outside, but that those effect uh, objective criteria um, which are listed and which are not conclusive um, can be used to prove the deliberate action. 
So this is for the for the background actually why uh, this uh, case has has brought um, in the first place because there was a really massive large scale infringement for for rights holders uh, with those shareholders. I cannot hear you, Jeremy. Jeremy, I think you're on mute. It's only been 15 months of remote working. Um, but I, I was going to ask about predictions. Um, does anyone want to to be to have a have a punt and and say which way these these could go these decisions or, or should we leave that for now? I mean, if if I if I just may very very quickly sort of following on you know George what George was saying and and uh, and I actually you know I, I would agree with uh, with what you what you said in in terms of you know the sort of the importance of of the criteria set out in 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 recital 84 um, you know if you have constructive knowledge and you fail to put in place effective and credible measures that a reasonably diligent operator would would put in place so that's that really i think it puts the new test i was surprised that the courts after having set out the general criteria, then actually went went on to provide, you know, the clarifications, which obviously that should be up to the, if you will, the, the national court to look at the relevant facts and in light of all the relevant facts and make make the assessment. So I and I, I wouldn't want to you know venture to guess where the court ends, but also I wouldn't take it as a given that the national court will follow the ECJ. Um, the question really is did the ECJ have all the facts? And the last point is, which I also read in, in the recital 84 just now, it's, it's not only that you put in place, it's also how you apply those measures. So, um, you know, it's not enough to say, I have this wonderful tool, you also need to apply it in a credit and, and effective measure. And that's a matter. So that's that's probably my, my penny's worth on this one. Thanks, Larry. Um, shall we move to knowledge? I know, I know um, a couple of you have touched on knowledge, and, and knowledge is obviously important. Uh, Strata was actually a number of legal principles today. Um, Julia, I'd just like to explore a little bit what the Court of Justice said about knowledge. And um, in particular, the, the, if the operator, you know, the platform, knows in a general sense that protected content is available, does that mean the operator is making an act of communication to the public? Um, I think by itself, it's pretty much excluded from the wording of uh, line 84 that the general knowledge as such would uh, uh, confirm communication to the public. I think Eleonora has said correctly that these uh, factors that have to be taken into account when determining whether an operator acted deliberately are not a checklist in the sense that not all of them have to be um, fulfilled in order to perform an act of communication to the public, but they're also not individual in the sense that one of them would be enough. But rather the court says that all of these factors have to be taken into account, not just whether they are there, but also the degree to which they are there. And especially regarding the knowledge criterion, I think the court is very clear that the knowledge alone is never enough because actually the way that it's phrased in line 84, it says, uh, despite the fact that it knows. So basically the knowledge alone is never enough. And then um, I would say at least uh, there would have to be an absence of, of technical measures. And there I would really highlight also what Georg has said that uh, in line 94, the court says that technical measures can be quite a few different things, such as, for example, having a notification button or a rapid alert procedure. So it's not uh, saying that in order to uh, refrain from communication to the public, the platform has to have in place something like content ID, but rather uh, something like a notification button could also be considered a, a, a technological measure. But even then, um, this is only one of the factors that are listed in um, in line 84. So I would even go as far as saying that 
um, even the combination of those two factors, general knowledge and an absence of technical measures, does not automatically mean there is communication to the public. Um, Rather, the court is supposed to take all of these factors into account that Eleonora has listed, so including uh, participation in, uh, in the selection of content or the business model or um, uh, the provision of uh, tools that facilitate infringement and basically doing a test based on all of those criteria to see whether the intervention was deliberate and in full knowledge of the consequences. So, so just thinking about that then, so the role of the operator is obviously considered as well as the knowledge, but does, does that potentially mean if, if you only have general knowledge and no actual knowledge that you would never be liable as a platform? No, it's, it's not that the general knowledge as such creates liability, but it's also not that there is no conceivable a uh, situation where a platform that doesn't have actual knowledge would uh, be liable. So it's possible for a platform that doesn't have actual knowledge to be liable, but only if a number of other criteria are fulfilled. So basically it's, it's a balancing test that at the end of the day decides um, whether or not there is communication to the public. So if you look at the Pirate Bay, for example, um, the, the court is basically uh, saying well, the operators were making statements encouraging users to, to perform infringement, and that played a role, for example, uh, because it showed intent. So I think um, what is also perhaps useful in this um, area is that the court says that uh, there is a close connection between the communication to the public under copyright law and the active role. And it does give a little bit more information about the standard of knowledge uh, in the area of active roles. So if we think now, which I think is, is quite a revelation compared uh, to the situation beforehand, that there is a congruence between communication to the public and active role, there I think line 109 is very useful, where the court basically confirms the Good Samaritan approach, but it also says that uh, knowledge and control means knowledge of the contents of the communication. So if you're just basically, uh, uh, if you're just um, ordering or, or categorizing things that people upload without any knowledge of the contents, then that would not be an active role and then consequently would not be a communication to the public. Okay, thank you. Um, let's still stay on knowledge, but in a different legal basis, this time in relation to Article 14. Um, and Lowry, could you please just summarise what the Court of Justice found um, in relation to whether operators fell within the Article 14 hosting defence? Sure, sure. Um, I, mean, look, I, I think it's fair to say that by and large, the, the Court you know, reiterates what, what, it, what it itself says is set, settled law. In, in in terms of sort of the kind of services that, that could be considered to be eligible for the safe harbor. So first of all, you know, the service, the, the intermediary needs to be of you know, technical, automatic and passive nature, right? And and what does that mean according to the court? You know, it means that that you know they 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 should not have knowledge or control. And I think the or is actually really important here, of over the content that that the users of of the service service make make available. And uh, and what you know to me is at least to me is sort of a first um, in in this area is that for the, for the first time the court expressly says that you know if you communicate to the public, if you are found to be sort of engaging in the act of communication in public, then you are not eligible for, for the safe harbors. And I think that's where we, we, we do see, as you said, Julie, kind of the, the congruence between sort of the, 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 the knowledge factor. So it seems to me that the, what the court is saying that once you have the required knowledge that you can be, you know, considered to be communicating public or otherwise, you know, so you 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 are considered to be communication public, then you are automatically so active. Your role is so active 
that you are disqualified from from the the the, uh, the, the safe safe harbor. So in in some respects, I would even go as far as arguing that what we are seeing is that with respect to copyrights, the the scope of application of the safe harbor is probably narrower now after this 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 decision than before, and maybe with respect to you know other types of content because of the fact that you first, arguably, what the courts would need to do first is to see if a service is communicating to the public. And if it's found to be communicating to the public, you don't need to consider whether it is eligible for safe harbors anymore. Sure, thanks. thanks, thanks. So, I mean, um... I mean, the concept, I mean, I saw, saw Georg um, um, had, was, was looking with interest. Um, I mean, the concepts of, of safe harbor, I suppose, and Laura and eBay, and looking at the, whether there is a passive neutral role, um, do you think, do you think, is that not the same principle still for Article 14, for the Article 14 hosting defense, that those, the Court of Justice is still applying those principles to its Article 14 interpretation in this case? Has anything actually ch changed, do you think? In, in terms of Article 14, I would say no. Uh, to, it, you know, the, the novelty to me is what they say in recital 100 and something. Uh, anyways, what they say is, is when they expressly, expressly spell out that if you are communicating in public, if you are found to, to be liable for or engaging in an act of communication in public, yeah. then you cannot you cannot claim protection from the safe harbor privileges. Yeah, no, I see. And, and I think that's been that's been sort of underpinning some of the you know the, the previous decisions. And I think Eleonora, in one of your articles, you probably even wrote about that. But this is the first time that the court actually spells this out. Yeah. So so what um what type of role or knowledge might an operator have? but still fall within the Article 14 defence? I think it is, um, as Laurie just said, uh, an operator may have knowledge in a general sense that protected content is made available illegally, for example, by receiving regular takedown notices. Um, and when this platform is a purely passive provider of digital infrastructure and at the same time, because it knows in general from those infringements, takes appropriate and effective measures to counter such infringements, then in theory, Article 14 would apply. But in this situation, it's not a copyright infringement, right? Because it's not communication to the public. So, in theory, there might be a, a responsibility for infringement of the platform, um, for, for, for the infringement of their users. However, in practice, I think the relevance in copyright cases will be very narrow. Okay. And, and so, let's, let's imagine, um, maybe this is for Eleonora, what, what happens if an operator is really diligent? and conducts its own monitoring to under its own initiative and it identifies some illegal content. Does that mean that platform will then gain actual knowledge and then lose out on the Article 14 defense despite you know doing doing the right thing? I, I think I think that's been excluded excluded by by us and, and Julia referred to that the sort of a kind of a, a, a good Samaritan clause which you know where the yeah. court says that you know if you gain knowledge through your if you will own initiatives for the purposes of of, of removing illegal content then that does not trigger you know the, the, the knowledge yes uh, i agree with uh, this uh, interpretation and uh, indeed uh, this is something uh, that uh, both the Advocate General and the Court of Justice uh, agreed upon. So uh, the AG was uh, fairly you know, explicit in saying uh, that holding otherwise would have uh, you know, an unwanted, if not perverse effect, uh, to discourage any type of proactive behaviors. And uh, he also correctly linked that uh, to earlier case law of the court itself, 
it is as early as L'Oreal and eBay that we have known that proactive behaviors are not to be discouraged and do not rule out safe harbor availability. It is also in line uh, with uh, national case law. Uh, for instance, uh, those uh, um, participants who are following from the UK might remember the 2014 decision of the High Court in Cartier, uh, where um, Mr. Justice Arnold, as it then was, uh, uh, relied on economic literature saying that in there are instances in which it is economically more efficient for an uh, uh, information society service provider to be proactive rather than waiting to receive notices or injunctions. So uh, it is a settled case law. It is also in line uh, with uh, policy uh, directions. Uh, here uh, the reference can be made uh, to the 2018 uh, Commission's uh, recommendation on uh, tackling uh, illegal content online. And uh, it is now one of the uh, crown jewels of the proposed DSA. Uh, but I guess that all this uh, history shows that what is presented as a big innovation uh, is uh, a codification of things that have been there for at least uh, 10 years. I would just like to point out the fact that, uh, okay, if you are diligent, you conduct your own investigation, but as soon as you find something, then uh, in order to continue enjoying the safe harbor protection, you need to comply with the requirements under letter B of paragraph one of that provision. That means that you need to take action to expeditiously remove or disable access to that content. So knowledge comes uh, with uh, responsibilities uh, also um, in line with what the law itself uh, provides. Thank you. Um, so Georg, just in relation to YouTube and uploaders, um, what, let's look at what do the courts say about those two operators and whether they fall inside or outside the Article 14 defenders? Yeah, I mean, what has been discussed in the last 10 years in that proceeding was a lot of, you know, questions, what gives you knowledge? And, you know, if you are a, a service like YouTube, you, you're not just giving, you know, hosting space, you do some indexation, you might have a search function, uh, you might also recommend videos, all of that happens with YouTube. If you go to YouTube, you get recommendation based on uh, your own behavior but also other users behaviors all of that is useful you wouldn't find content relevant for you and uh, uh, the claimant in our proceeding and, and many right holders have always argued if you do those things you go beyond uh, uh, being a neutral uh, passive uh, host provider and you become active and that has been a, a huge question obviously and i think uh, it has been answered uh, pretty clear, clearly again by the court saying that you need, you know, those activities might provide you with some general knowledge, but you really need specific uh, knowledge that there's a specific content which is infringing copyright. Uh, uh, so I think the answer is uh, pretty helpful uh, for us, that it's a helpful clarification. Uh, uh, and I also want to point out, which is, and that is a connected question, uh, which was discussed in length in the uh, opinion of the Advocate General, uh, and it's really very important in practice. You know, what are the requirements uh, for notification that you know provides you such specific knowledge? The court doesn't say a lot, but I think in the end he seems to uh, uh, to agree with what the Advocate General has said on the notification requirements. Uh, the court makes clear that. You know, after, the infringement must be apparent for the provider, so that the pro, uh, provider does not need to undertake uh, a, a legal examination. All of that has to be very clear from from a notification uh, you send to the provider. And uh, at the, I think it's in 150 in the court mentioned that you only have specific knowledge coming from a notification if if the notification is sufficiently precise and adequate, adequately substantiated. So it's not enough that uh, somebody just tells you, hey, that's my content, take it down. They have to substantiate that. And uh, the, the standards seem to be fairly high for such required notifications. And I want to remind you, and I, uh, I thought that was an, a very relevant quote from the Advocate General's opinion. Uh, he said that only this interpretation that you know you have to have a very clear notification um, can avert the risk uh, of intermediary providers providers 
becoming judges of online legality and the risk of over removal. And I think that's that's an important point. One last thing I want to mention on that because I think it's so interesting. I, I would also like to hear what others think about it. I think at two uh, point, uh, two uh, paras in the decision, the court mentions this. I think it's 113 and also 116. Uh, the court points out that once you get, get as a provider a, a, a notification and you have a takedown obligation, you not just have to look whether the content is illegal under copyright law, but also whether the removal uh, of the content would impede the freedom of expression rights by its users. So that is something which is not quite clear, which sounds, you know, progressive and interesting. And, uh, you know, I would be, I hope that we hear more, more about that in the Polish case, but uh, uh, I think that raises some interesting points because that's something rather novel that uh, uh, that's a surprise let's put it this way you have to not only consider whether it's a copyright infringement but if you come to a conclusion yeah it's copyright infringing you might have to say well the removal might still not be okay so that's uh, how i read that but it's also not very clear but uh, happy to to learn from others what they think about that that issue i think larry please <laughs> no, you you wouldn't be surprised. I think my interpretation is slightly different yeah, about that. I think I think what the court court is essentially saying what is what is actually pretty trivial, um, which essentially because you know the freedom of expression is already it is part of the copyright system, you know that that we have, and. Uh, and, and freedom of expression is taken into account through the existing exceptions. So the question is, you know, it really, you know, they didn't have to say, say the latter part of that statement. They would have just have to say whether the content is illegal. Um, and, and that already covers also the freedom of expression point through the exception. So if you are entitled to exceptions, the content is not illegal, right? So as said, um, it sounds sounds novel. I would respectfully argue that actually the point is pretty trivial. Excellent. Um, so can I can I just um, finish off a conversation we started um, about the notification letters, um, and 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 maybe Julie, I just I just want to ask one thing, which which Georg touched on. What what do you think happens if the letter is deficient or the right claimed is not clear? Does that does that mean there's no actual knowledge? Yes, I mean I think this is also where the freedom of expression um, issue comes in. I think it's um, well I'm glad to hear actually that Laurie thinks that this is something that was already clear, but I think it's extremely helpful for for the court to clarify also that the platform has to take freedom of expression into account and not just the legislature, let's say, or the courts, um, because this is something that's also in the Digital Services Act, and I think it's a, a good idea to clarify this. Um, but uh, I, I think Laurie is also correct about uh, the exceptions and limitations that uh, basically this means that just because there is a notification of a protected work, that this doesn't necessarily mean that it's an infringing use. And I think also the court is, is uh, pointing towards that um, that distinction. The, the Advocate General has made it much more explicit uh, in saying that if it's not absolutely apparent in the case that there is no exception applying to uh, the work, then the right holder who is sending the notice actually has to explain why they think that, that an exception does not apply. And I think this is um, also what the court is referring to here. So it, it refers positively to this whole part of the Advocate General opinion where this is pointed out. So I would say the practice that we have seen in the past where all that most rights holders do is just say, here my work is being used and therefore you have to remove it would no longer be sufficient to create actual knowledge. But actually the right holder is going to have to say in the notice, here my work is being used and this is why I think that this use is infringing. That's uh, the way that I read uh, that. So I would say a notice that is um, insufficiently precise to create 
the possibility for the platform to uh, basically make the, the illegality apparent is not enough to create actual knowledge. And I think that's actually a problem for the DSA um, or for the draft DSA, because in the draft DSA in Article 14.3, I think, uh, it is suggested by the European Commission that uh, uh, it's basically enough if the notifier can show that they believe that there has been an Ill illegal act in order to create actual knowledge. And I would say the court is here saying that this would not be compatible with the charter because it ties it to fundamental rights. I don't think the DSA can override the idea that actual knowledge only exists if there is knowledge of a concrete illegal act. And if the notification is insufficient to create uh, that knowledge, then it cannot create actual knowledge. Elizabeth. Actually, I, I would oppose uh, this view of uh, having to, uh, to, to argue that no exemption applies here, because if you're the right hold, then you have exclusive rights. And there is um, your work communicated to the public without your authorization. Then the first impression is there is an infringement. Now, if the user or the platform wants to rely on exemption, they have to prove this kind of exemption. I mean, that there might be a back and forth as now foreseen and provided by, by the Article 17 process, but I do not agree that all of this has also uh, has already to be elaborated in a takedown notice. Yeah. Look, yeah, I, I, absolutely, I would, I would, I would hundred percent agree with, with Ursula on, on, on that point. You know. But how can the infringement be apparent if the notice does not explain why it's infringing? Well, I think it can be it can be sufficiently apparent by providing information on you know on on the on the work on the ownership of the work and then obviously if if after that you know the user still claims that actually i am entitled to an exception we are still dealing and i know you may disagree but we are still dealing with exceptions um, to rights exclusive rights so if you want to claim that you are entitled to an exception then there's a process how you can you can you know sort of benefit to from your exception, so that's the way it, it it works. But but you know, if you take your view to an extreme, it would mean that every notice would have to go through a court proceeding, and the court would would then decide whether the exception was you know applicable or not. Mm -hmm. And and the fact is that there are you know millions and millions of notices sent for infringement, valid infringement. So that could well, I'm I'm not make just to clarify, I'm not making that extreme argument. I think even the advocate general said that if it's apparent that no exception can apply, then the right holder does not have to explain that. It's just if if there is a situation where it's conceivable that an exception could apply. So it's not every case. You know, if I down if I upload a full movie that has not been released yet without any contextual information, it's apparent that no exception applies. So it's not like any notice would have to have this. But you said yourself that the, the reference to the platform has to uh, um, do so with regard or do regard to the principle of freedom of expression. You said that this refers to the exceptions. So yes. if, the if the platform has to take the exceptions into account, when deciding whether to take something down or not, it can only do that if the information is there, right? And, and I because think the, you know, the user does not get asked. The user doesn't get to make exactly, it. exactly. And, and I think the normal form form of notice is already, as you as you will know, you know, normally includes a statement by whoever notices that you know, to the best of their knowledge, you know, the, the information they provide is is, is correct, and and that. That must be right, right? Again, it, it really is, you know, who's who who should have the and and at what point the the owners, you know, if you will, of of or taking the responsibility of the accuracy of the of the notices. And uh, and if the right owner takes the responsibility for the accuracy of his notices, then, then surely that must be enough. So let's um Let's maybe move on slightly from notices. 
and look at the, the, the big picture here. So has the courts got the balance right? Um, you know, for example, weighing up the fundamental rights, the risk of overblocking versus rights holders' rights. Does, does anyone want to try to deal with that? Well, I think for the first time there is an explicit balancing, which I think is very welcome. So uh, I think the court follows the advocate general in saying that uh, the, the high level of protection awarded to rights holders in EU copyright law does not mean that there doesn't need to be a balancing. And uh, I think it's very welcome that the court makes such explicit reference to freedom of expression throughout the ruling. So in that respect, I think especially with regard to uh, the actual knowledge, um, the, the overall balance is sort of going in the right direction. I was personally more happy with the solution suggested by the Advocate General, but I also agree with Eleonora that uh, the court is not going to contradict itself if it doesn't change the end result. So uh, I guess this was to be expected. Does anyone else have any, any views? Eleonora, please. If I may, Jeremy, uh, I, I think uh, that uh, in the end, uh, you know, mm, the court uh, wanted to give something a bit to everyone, so wanted not to displease too much any of the interest stakeholders. So in doing so, uh, it adopted a, a much less transient view than what the Advocate General had done, because uh, the preferred option for the AG was to say that user uploaded platforms never communicate to the public and the safe harbors apply irrespective of the type of liability. I, uh, I think that the Court of Justice uh, was correct in avoiding uh, such uh, an absolute or absolutist depending on the perspective view and adopt uh, in line with its earlier case law a uh, more uh, um, complex type of assessment that requires taking into consideration different aspects. Having said that, and looking at the uh, you know, fundamental rights angle, uh, certainly uh, you know, the Court of Justice refers uh, to the requirement of fair balance. Uh, this has become a kind of a topos in a CJU copyright case law. You find it uh, in uh, many decisions, in, especially in uh, more uh, recent ones. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't see the same level of uh, engagement and willingness to say that we instead see in the Advocate General Opinion, the AG referred expressly to uh, copyright protection under Article 17, freedom to conduct a business, freedom of expression, freedom of the arts. The Court of Justice refrained from doing that. And I guess that in part, this is also due to the fact that in its, um, in its next um, near future, there is you know, Article 17 to, to address in light of fundamental rights and freedom. So this, that might be a reason, uh, but uh, um, Clearly, insofar as freedom of expression is concerned, and you know, um, tying back to what was discussed before, um, I think that the Court of Justice uh, will not want to go as far as saying that freedom of expression uh, applies uh, irrespective of available exceptions and limitations, because these uh, will contradict uh, its own rulings, uh, Grand Chamber rulings in uh, Funke Media and Spiegel Online, uh, in which it said uh, that indeed uh, this is a, a balancing exercise uh, for the legislature to be done in the first place uh, and then uh, for courts uh, to apply in practice. If I, if I may uh, add, I think if you ask about the balancing of fundamental rights, uh, uh, in that decision, Jeremy, I think it's also important to bear in mind that this was a limited referral. So the, 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 the two main questions were on communication to the public right and then on the hosting safe harbor. And in regard to both answers, the court, you know, anchors fundamental rights, uh, uh, which is also interesting to maybe a further extent that I would have expected. But the main uh, the, the main question that has relevance for fundamental rights in this context is actually the, the question of the extent of state on obligations, you know, uh, how to avoid overblocking when you use automated enforcement tools, the question that we now discuss uh, uh, transposing Article 17. And, and that was a big surprise for me, maybe just for me, because I was, you know, too involved in the weeds of the national proceeding, but here the the focus had always been on the state on obligations. I don't think the claimant really believed that, uh, that we would be held directly liable and he would get damage claims. So the question was more, you know, in the 
context of the German German Stirrer Haftung intermediate liability, you know, what is the what are the obligations of YouTube? Do they have to employ content ID without the cooperation of the cooperation of the right holder, even if that would cause overblocking? Should we also use other technologies like word filters or even manual control? Again, even if the risk of overblocking is high. And those questions have not been referred, which was really a surprise. I mean, looking back, I think it's it was it might have been a wise decision. And the, the court doesn't uh, you know, answer hypotheticals. So they didn't go into those issues, which uh, is probably uh, was also wise because you know this proceeding could have continued another 10 years with those questions. And that would be really history because now we have Article 17 and the questions have to be now addressed in the framework of Article 17. And here I think the, 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 the Polish case will be super relevant. So I think all the people who, you know, I have expected more on fundamental rights in this decision. I mean, they should wait for the for the Polish case because those issues will be primarily addressed in that proceeding. That is that is my uh, expectation at least. And, and that's probably a really good segue into my next question, actually, which is about Article 17. And 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 you know, what's the future for the act of the uh, act of communication to the public? Um, given this this CJ decisions in the context of you could say the old regime. And, and you, you might say the future's about Article 17. Um, you know, are there any hints in this decision about the future? Well, if I may, I, I think. Oh, sorry. I, <laughs> I think. Well, we're we're probably of the same opinion that Article 17 and its national implementations are lex specialis. Um, and in Germany, from 1st August onwards, um, there is a on the one hand, a facilitation of proof that OCSSPs are actually communicating to the public um, by pointing out only objective criteria to define platforms which fall under Article 17. So the subjective um, element of knowledge and deliberate action is gone from Article 17. On the other hand, of course, it provides uh, those platforms as possibility to escape the uh, resulting liability. But the judgment will certainly stay relevant for a vast number of platforms which are not falling in the scope of um, OCSSPs. And, and therefore, it will certainly be relevant uh, in future, especially uh, regarding platforms which are providing a structure and a, a system for infringement. And, and this is actually the, the interesting thing in, um, and, and there I see it also a little bit different um, than Julian, I think, because um, in para um, 84, the, the uh, judge actually differentiates between platforms which are providing structure for infringements, which then leads to deliberate action. And on the other hand, um, platforms which generally know about infringement but don't do anything against it as a um, diligent operator would actually do. So I think here is a, a clear differentiation which should not be mixed up and uh, at which will still uh, be relevant for um, yeah, untrusted uh, platforms which are aiming to uh, provide access to uh, illegal content. Yeah, I mean, just, just to say, I think I think Ursula makes a, a, a really really interesting, you know, and and an intelligent point there in in terms of Article 17, which sort of transforms the the sort of the, the subjective side or elements into objective criteria in Article Article 17 with respect to you know a certain category of of of, of you know video sharing or content sharing platforms, and I think that's that is probably the value of Article 17 going going forward, which is it, it brings the legal and commercial clarity that hopefully you know, every, everyone will benefit from. And then, interesting enough, I mean, and this is just really personal thinking, but I would I would say that there are definitely echoes of Article 17 in the recital 84, and in in that particular criteria which says even if you have constructive knowledge and you you fail to take credible and effective steps. 
sort of smacks like 17.4, you know, in some respects. I, I mm. think it's, yeah, I think there are two possibilities. Either it's, it's uh, exactly what Laurie is saying. So at the end of the day, the court, if the court decides that Article 17 is compatible with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, then it's probably going to look very different from what um, uh, stakeholders initially had in mind, because then the court does clarify in recitals 84 and 94 that uh, the best efforts to uh, ensure the unavailability does not mean upload filters, but that something like, for example, a complaint button might be enough regarding uh, uh, the best efforts, or and also that uh, its interpretation of general monitoring is basically saying that it's only not general monitoring if the monitoring is specific to infringements, which would mean that it would not be possible to just say, this is a work that is protected by copyright, please block all instances of it, because that would be general monitoring according to the court. So I think it's possible that um, in this ruling, the court is preparing the ground for rejecting Article 17 and is sort of creating an Article 17 light regime. But it's also possible that it's preparing the ground for accepting Article 17, but in a in a reading that I think is different from what rights holders had in mind. I would actually I would actually read this exactly the opposite way. That may not be a surprise, but. Uh... But, you know, for instance, the actual reference to content ID, you know, when it's, uh, if you will, gives clarification as to the application of the criteria, to me, it puts in bed this entire discussion of whether, whether you know, ACR is, 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 is allowed or not. Clearly, the court says it's not only allowed, but it is part of the credible and effective measures that certain operators must take in place if they want to avoid liability. But there are different readings. I, I totally agree. I, I mean, the hurdle is really high in this um, 84. It says uh, appropriate and effective measures. I mean, effective, that's a blocking system. I mean, I, I don't think you can read it just functionally and um, just um, take take uh, small things out of out of this judgment um, being sufficient. I think um, effective is quite clear. Yeah, but if you look at the actual wording of line 94, the court says that uh, given all of these different measures that YouTube has taken, it is apparent that this criterion is fulfilled. To me, that says even yeah. if it did not take all of those measures, the criterion might still be fulfilled. And I think it's also yeah. important to, to take into account that in, uh, in line 84, the court says these are factors that all need to be taken into account and need to be weighted against each other. So it's not the case that if one of them is fulfilled, you're automatically uh, performing an act of or, or Or the court said that because YouTube did all these, all these measures, you know, put in place all these measures, it considered that YouTube was not communicated with the public. As said, it still leaves the discussion whether the measures were also applied in an effective and credible manner, which is up to the national court to decide. If I might add, I mean, I really read the decision as uh, the CJU trying to establish some sort of coherence between Article 17 and the liability regime outside of Article 17. I would not say like past re old regime and new regime because as Ursula pointed out, you know, it, this, this uh, uh, old regime this will stay applicable for all services that are out of scope for Article 17 or, you know, maybe also outside of copyright. Uh, so it will, uh, um, uh, it will remain uh, hugely important. And so it's probably very wise to, uh, you know, establish that a certain level of coherence and as Laurie pointed out and I agree if you read recital uh, 84 of the decision it, it sounds really like the best efforts uh, requirement under under article 17 and you can you know be happy about it because you have a certain assumption what that means best efforts or you can say as you are points out say well maybe this Peterson decision is also helpful for those who you know don't have a content ID like measures but uh, I think uh, 
that it has been wise of the court to you know establish some sort of coherence i rather read it as they probably let article 17 survive and you know have that coherence between the systems but you know maybe i mean they don't say anything about that i think you can't read much on that because even if they don't keep it alive it's probably good to have established some sort of coherence before but we will see I mean, just just on keeping it alive, uh, maybe maybe for the audience, let's look at that a bit more. Eleonora, could you just explain about the the Polish challenge and and what's happening with Article Seventeen? Yes, sir. so this is the next uh, big case uh, in front of the Court of Justice. Uh, shortly after uh, the adoption of the directive. Uh, in 2019, the Republic of Poland uh, lodged uh, a complaint with the Court of Justice, uh, alleging uh, that uh, part of the provision, in particular uh, its fourth paragraph, uh, would be uh, contrary to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, uh, Freedom of Expression and Information in Article 11, uh, and requested that this part be annulled, uh, and if, if this is not possible without also altering the overall content of the provision, then the request is to annul Article 17 in its entirety. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, where we stand. Uh, there was uh, uh, the hearing before the Court of Justice, and now the next step uh, is uh, the opinion of the Advocate General, who incidentally is the same one as in the YouTube uh, Siando case. And this opinion is expected in a couple of weeks uh, on the 15th of July. Um, after that, uh, uh, we'll see what happens uh, for uh, the uh, YouTube uh, Siando case. Uh, it took uh, nearly a year to have the judgment. Uh, so let's see if the same uh, is uh, um, also in relation to the Polish challenge. Um, so having said that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I uh, agree with what uh, has uh, just been uh, outlined uh, by uh, Georg, uh, Lauri, and, um, and also Ursula. So I would tend to say that the Court of Justice uh, tried to find a way to square uh, you know, the, the picture and make uh, Article 3 and Article 17 coexist with each other, considering that indeed uh, not everyone will be subject to Article 17. Uh, if we take, for instance, uh, uploaded, if it was actually be, uh, demonstrated that uh, 90 to 96 percent of the content on the cyber locker is illegal, then it will not uh, it will fall under the Article 3 regime in any case. So it will not be eligible for uh, the um, for the regime uh, found uh, under uh, you know the, the the DSM directive which excludes a cyber locker from the definition of online content sharing service providers. So having said that and looking at what the Advocate General reasoned in his opinion last year, I feel that also back then he was thinking about the fate of Article 17 because he engaged quite extensively with the content of the provision and made a comparison between the regimes in Article 3 and 17 and also suggested towards the end that if the EU legislature wishes to set the balance between different fundamental rights differently as he thought that would be the case of Article 17, then he said this uh, you know will be possible and it will be you know the prerogative of, of the EU legislature so that will be my take on this uh, challenge but uh, of course uh, you know it is uh, still very uncertain as to how the, uh, the court of justice will eventually uh, rule and also how the advocate general will advise uh, the court to rule Thanks, Eleanor. Yeah, it's a very interesting development. Um, so we're we're watching it with interest. Um, just just when you mentioned the um the, the percentage of illegal legal content, it just triggered. Uh, there's a question actually from one of the audience, which I might just put to you now. Um, and it's this is from Sebastian. Um, it says I understand the question of, in relation to illegal versus legal content might be a crucial factor, at least for cases involving cyber lockers. Practically speaking, it might be challenging to provide proof of content being available in such cyber lockers. How are rights holders to fulfill such a burden of proof? And would you think that the 90 to 96 percentage invoked are some kind of fixed threshold, or will this be assessed on a case by case basis? Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, I, I feel addressed. <laughs> so, um, no, I think it's it's not a fixed number. Um, this number came up along the case and I think it was actually very helpful um, by the European Court of Justice to point out that 
this is uh, not a criteria which must be fulfilled because um, as, as the participant just said, um, it's really hard to, to prove, um, especially if you do not have any insight, um, especially if you, under European um, civil process law, um, it's, it's hard to get an insight. It's not like a US discovery law where you have, uh, where you can take those uh, looks on the service um, and evaluate. And even if you could imagine, you would have to, uh, evaluate all files on YouTube or all files on, on upload. Um, this is an estimate uh, based on um, uh, certain findings uh, which was done by uh, relevant groups. So I think it's helpful that the European Court of Justice pointed out that this is not essential, but if you can prove it, of course, then you're in the Pirate Bay uh, judgment. So then you can communicate to the public clearly. And with all those uh, platforms, it's always a big challenge um, to get behind the what's technically going on. So um, we always involved actually IT technicians to find out who is doing what on those platforms. Um, but that's already a high, really high burden um, to get into, into those structures. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, so probably the last just topic from my perspective, um, Digital Services Act and draft. Um, does, 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 this, does this judgment um, you know, is it is it any relevance for the for the future Digital Services Act? Does anyone have any comments about any interaction, Julia? Yes. Yeah, so I think two I've already mentioned. One is that uh, the the judgment does uh, declare some responsibility for the protection of fundamental rights to the platforms, which is also in the DSA. Uh, so there, I think it goes in the same direction. And where there's a clear contradiction is that uh, in the provision of the DSA that creates an automatic actual knowledge resulting from notifications of a certain type. I think there the court is very clear that uh, actual knowledge means uh, knowledge of specific infringing acts. And if the notification does not do that, then there should not be actual knowledge. And since it's grounded in fundamental rights, I think the, um, the legislator should change that in the DSA. But um, I think other than that, it's, it's somewhat pointing in a similar direction, especially regarding the treatment of fundamental rights. I agree. Um, you, can also, you, can, you can already um, see the judgment using some of the thinking and, and some of the discussions uh, relevant for the DSA. And especially the platforms ought to take more responsibility from my perspective and open its eyes towards, possi towards possible infringement and also the platform's possibilities to prevent such infringement. I didn't order, please. If I may just add to what uh, Julia said, I agree with her. Um, I, I would like just uh, to note uh, that uh, if we look uh, at the Commission's original proposal, uh, it speaks uh, of uh, URL-based notices, uh, and uh, uh, the proposal itself is, present, is presented as a codification of existing CJU case law, uh, but uh, I don't think you can find a single CJU decision in which the court has said that the notice must be URL-based, uh, and uh, this goes uh, as early as law real and i think that uh, with the youtube siando decision there is a confirmation that yes the notice must be specific but not necessarily needs to be a url based notice but yeah. the court uh, i'm sorry but yeah, the, go the, go the okay. legislator can decide things that haven't already been decided by the court right i mean the only case where the legislator cannot do that is if the court has said actually this interpretation is uh, grounded in the charter so i would i agree with you that perhaps the court has not said that so far but i still think that the legislator can change it whether yeah. it's a good idea or not is a different question no no okay. exactly 
just in one second, uh, just that if we look at the accompanying memorandum to the proposal, the Commission presents it as a crystallization of the status quo, when I'm not sure that this is always uh, uh, the case. So my consideration was all in that respect. Then, of course, I agree that if the legislator wants to change things, uh, that is indeed what the legislator is for. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then I think it's it's just worth noting whether it has any any practical meaning. But you look at the the commission's proposal, and they they actually refer in you know in the sort of recitals and uh, and, and of their work in in a few instances to the advocate general's opinion, and and that may not be valid any longer. So that might be something they want to want to take another look and whether whether it has had an effect in particular on on the sort of the way they interpret the scope of of the the, the safe harbors but then obviously you know it's interesting to see but that's sort of been discussed as the the the, the good summary and and in that respect i think actually the 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 judgment provides some helpful clarification also as to how the dsa provision should be interpreted, including that you know the uh, that if you will Im immunity only applies if you take these measures in order to prevent the availability of infringing content, and also that that alone those activities alone do not you know make you eligible for the safe harbors. You still need to 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 sort of to meet all the other conditions for for the safe harbor. But uh, other than that, I, I, I would concur with the previous speakers. So we've hit no, over 90 minutes. Um, that, that probably is enough of in terms of my, my questions for the panel. Um, maybe we just have time for one question. Um, there, there's, a, there's a few, we've already asked one. And this is um, from Victor Rosa. Don't you find it awkward that a peer-to-peer -peer platform that does not host content like TP6 performs communication to the public, whereas YouTube that actually hosts and shares the content seems to need actual knowledge to perform communication to the public. Among other similarities that seem to put this decision in conflict with Zigo. Um, does anyone want to deal with that? Well, yeah, I, I may. First, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I would just say that I, I would respectfully actually disagree with the interpretation of what the, the decision says. Um, you know, as, as we've discussed, you know, a, a platform that has constructed knowledge and fails to take appropriate steps, you know, to effect, effectively and in a credible manner prevent the availability of content actually is communicating to the, to the public. Um, so, uh, it is not only actual knowledge, it's, it actually is, you know, the, the scope of primary liability for, for if you will, for, for communication public is pushed way beyond that. I agree, it's very much in line with, uh, with the concept of, sorry, Julie, uh, of all to know. Um, with the Pirate Bay, the court find the Pirate Bay all to know because of the high percentage of illegal content. So the court said, well, there's, there's no possibility that you wouldn't know. Um, and in this decision, this is actually um, going further now. So uh, an operator ought to know if they provide certain tools to make um, content illegally available. If they select the content that is made illegally um, available, or if they provide a certain business model uh, which incentivates um, communicating to the public of illegal pub, uh, content. So this is all a concept of ought to know. Um, it's actually, um, it's, it's cut off from GS Media, where, which would have taken this further. Um, if we would have applied GS Media here, we could then say, well, the platform ought to know if they use this content um, to make profit. Um, 
this is of course this would have been um, even further breaching this concept of ought to know but i think and 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 there is where the uh, court of justice is now mitigating a little bit and also taking into account uh, the, the risk of overblocking I actually partially agree with the comment in the sense that it's not very logical that the Pirate Bay is uh, dealt with in the area of primary liability. And this is actually the argument that the Advocate General made, that it would be a lot more logical to say the Pirate Bay is a case of secondary liability because it's not the Pirate Bay that is performing the infringing acts, it's the Pirate Bay that is helping the infringing acts. But I don't agree with the, the sort of reverse logic that any platform that does uh, host something therefore should be liable, obviously. But I do think uh, that you know there is a certain logic to saying that the Pirate Bay ruling uh, took the wrong approach by dealing with it in the framework of communication to the public, but that is water under the bridge now. I mean, the, the Advocate General gave the court the opportunity to reverse its logic on that, and it didn't take that opportunity, so I don't expect this uh, to change in the future. And also to add First. to Pia's uh, remarks, uh, uh, didn't even uh, uh, address it because you know the advocate general goes on and on and on on this uh, primary secondary liability and the court of justice uh, just skips the topic uh, so uh, this no, it seems doesn't... to be I don't think it skips it. I think it says, yes, the safe harbor does apply to primary liability, just in copyright, it doesn't make a difference because communication to the public and active role are aligned. But I think for other areas, it does make a difference. I, I think I think that's that's correct. And that's, as said, you know, it would seem that actually in the future, the scope of application for the safe harbor Will be different from copyrights, you know, for copyright and then potentially for other types of, of content. You know, just a, a thought. Well, um, unless anyone has any remarks on the panel that they, 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 they wish to share, I think it's probably a good place to wrap up today's session. Um, so, I think we've answered a few questions from the audience, um, and I and I, I just want to thank the panelists for joining today. That was a really interesting discussion, just like last time, and um, and thank you very much. And thank you to the audience, obviously, for for joining for the for the, for the, for the session. And I hope hope they got something out of it. Well, thank you, Jeremy. I'd like to add my thanks on behalf of of Blacker. Um, and also just to um, mention that um, we were so lucky to have some returning panellists um, in the shape of um, uh, Julia Rader, the former M MEP, now Society for Civil Rights, uh, Lauri Reichart, Chief Legal Officer of IFPI, um, new panellists, uh, George Nolte, uh, Senior uh, Legal Council in charge of litigation and copyright for Google, and Ursula uh, Feindor Schmidt, a copyright specialist with Lawson Law Firm, and of course um, Bristow's Jeremy Bloom in the chair. And thanks, last but not least, to Eleonora. In fact, Eleonora, I apologise, your director of the Institute for IP and Market Law at the University of Stockholm. I, I apologise for um, attributing you uh, to another university at the very beginning. So um, we've got so much to think about and uh, I can see lots of fruitful arguments coming up in cases in the future. So I'd like to add my thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.